which is going to be our sermon title, is No More Asses. Don't worry, I'm going to bring that out in the scripture, and y'all going to get it now. I can't stop it. So. But that is my positive confession today. My wife was messing with me because you know, I think it was a month ago I preached Get the Hell Out. And she told me, she said, you just turned it into a cussing preacher. <laughs> they all have context. Somebody say context. context. So you'll get this in a, in a couple minutes. So don't, don't leave out. Amen. Um, I was going to make a joke, but I'm going to leave that alone. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So t today, my positive confession is no more asses. Amen. So uh, let me just go ahead and say a prayer for us, and we're going to jump into this time. Lord, we want to say thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for the ways in which, uh, Lord, I love how the scriptures say it, that if we would, uh, Lord, have been lost in, if we would have remained in our sin, Lord, we would have been cut off. Lord, but you redeemed us. And so, Lord, we are just eternally thankful to you for the work of active redemption in our lives and ways that are leaning forward into a world change. Lord, as we take this time to read your words, to think on them, to reflect on them, uh, Lord, we pray that your spirit might come and illuminate that which you want us to hear in our hearts today. We'll be careful to give your name all the praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Someone say amen. Yeah. All right, we're going to be coming out of uh, the book of 1 Samuel, uh, the ninth chapter. 1 Samuel, the ninth chapter. For those that uh, want to follow along, I will have it up here uh, on the screen. If you trust me, if you want to read along with me, we can do that as well. And it reads, now there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bechoreth, the son of Ephiah, a Benjamite. Now, I'm reading out of the King James Version today. I've just been feeling that a little bit lately. Uh, a mighty man of power, and he had a son whose name was Saul, a choice young man and a goodly. And there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. From his so shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of the people. And the asses of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. And Kish said to Saul, his son, take now one of the servants with thee and arise, go seek the asses. And he passed through the Mount Ephraim and passed through the land of Shalisha. Some of y'all didn't know y'all cousin had a land back then. And they it. <laughs> <laughs> but they found them not. Then they passed through the land of Shalim. That's the guy that sells the bracelets at the flea market. And there they were not. And he passed through the land of the Benjamites, but they found them not. And when they were come to the land of Zuth, Saul said to his servant that was with him, Come, and let us return, lest my father leave caring for the asses and take thought for us. And he said unto him, Behold now, there is in this city a man of God, and he is an honorable man. All that he saith cometh surely to pass. Now let us go thither, peradventure he can show us our way that we should go. And now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear, Samuel's the prophet, a day before Saul came, saying, tomorrow about this time. I knew I kept hearing somebody talking. Okay. Uh, all right. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear, a day before Saul came, tomorrow about this time I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin, and thou shalt anoint him to be captain over my people Israel, that he might save my people out of the hand of the Philistines, for I have looked upon my people because their cry is come unto me. And when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said unto him, Behold the man who I spake to thee of, this same shall reign over my people. Then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate, and said, Tell me, I pray thee, where's the seer's house, where the seer's house is? And Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me unto the high place, for ye shall eat with me today, and tomorrow I will let thee go, and will tell thee all that is in thy heart. And as for thine asses that were lost three days ago, set not thy mind on them, for they are found. Amen. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. If you can do it, some of y'all might not be able to do it. Look at your neighbor and say, no more asses. <laughs> Amen. Some of y'all can't say it unless you're mad. Amen. 
No more ashes. In this life, and we all enter it in different places with different stories. And, and depending on where we're born in life and in the life of our story, we're all born into different places at different times and different situations. Some of us are born into life with privilege. Some of us are born on what some might deem the wrong side of the fence. Um, but regardless as to where we're born, the, the reality is we experience life through the lenses that we are born with, our, particularly our racial, our gender identities. All of these kind of make up the ways in which we understand uh, the world that we are living in and, and how it is that we need to respond to that world. And so we live life making choices, trying to figure out how do I succeed based upon the story that I'm in and who I am within that story. And I believe in this story that we have here, uh, Saul starts off in a very specific place, actually with privilege, but yet finds himself running into some different circumstances and challenges. Uh, but I believe it will be helpful for us in this month of positive confession uh, to begin to think about how did Saul navigate uh, the challenges that found their way into his life and how might God also be challenging us to deal and confront uh, some of the things that are showing up uh, in our lives. So let's talk a little bit about Saul. As you come uh, into this passage of scripture, it's interesting because the writer really wants us to understand who Saul is. He lists off all of these different things of uh, Saul's father. He actually starts there and says Saul is the son of a man named Kish, who was a very powerful individual. Right? The way that this writer talks about Kish, you know, he, he talks about him like he is this mighty man of power. That Kish is a person with a lot of influence. Uh, uh, Kish is the one with a lot of swag, if you will. That's, that's for the, us younger people. Everybody say swag. swag. You all right. All right, so Kish is, is this individual who's got great power. He's, got, uh, 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 he's respected, and Saul is his son. The writer goes on to tell us that Saul was the cream of the crop for his generation. That Saul uh, looked good. The writer, was a, the writer really wanted to tell us that. It was interesting. I don't know what that was all about, but we'll leave that alone. But they wanted us to know that Saul looked good, that Saul was tall, which at that time was a societal kind of measurement of power and influence. It told us that Saul was well-liked, that Saul was a very good individual. He had a lot of uh, uh, ability to build relational equity, that Saul was this person from a great, powerful family who also had a lot of great individual capacity, who was actually stepping forth into the world getting ready to get some real work done and, you know, kick butt and take names. That, that Saul was this individual that shows up and is very uh, powerful in position to do a lot of great things. And yet, in this story, it's very interesting that Saul, while he's full of all of this potential, his father tells him, you know what, I know you're full of a lot of purpose, I know you're full of a lot of talent, I know you got a lot going for you, I know you're my son, you got all this, but actually, I just want you to go search for my asses that are lost. And I want us to kind of sit with that a little bit, that, that Saul is this individual that we have this huge... Uh, uh, this huge thing painted for us, this huge idea of, of Saul's capacity, yet he's sent to do something very menial. Yeah, something that some might argue is below Saul. Yeah. That, that Saul would say, you know, I mean, considering I've got all this relational equity, considering I'm good looking, considering everybody likes me, considering, you know, where I'm positioned with my servants and my capacity, but you want me to go chase some asses. I want us to just think about that ass for a minute. I'm talking about a donkey for, for some of us that haven't caught on yet. Because <laughs> I know we got a lot going on in our world, right? So, amen. Words matter. Somebody say amen. amen. Oh, hallelujah. Get your wine out of there. Praise God. So, so Saul is sent to chase these asses, the donkeys. I want us to understand about the ass that, that this ass during those times only were existed to do one thing, and that was just pull plows, work, and do the menial type of activity to run your establishment, your farm. It was, he was sent out as an errand boy to go and accomplish these things that were happening uh, within uh, his life. Here is a person who is full of everything good, has been tasked with chasing something stupid, an ass. All this potential Saul has, but he has to go chase an ass. He has servants. And team members to help him in his cultural course of life. 
Yet he's chasing an ass. All the potential to succeed and prosper, but he's chasing an ass. You see, sometimes life puts us in search of the asses, people who we respect and who love us, sometimes even arc the trajectories of our life to be aimed at things that are less than God's ultimate desire for us. You find yourself knowing who you are inside your body, knowing who you are with respect to God's call on your life, yet you find yourself chasing and pursuing things that are less than God's idea for your life. I know not y'all, y'all very spiritual people here at the way, but at times I found myself in positions where I felt like what I am doing and engaged in with respect to others or even with respect to myself is less than what God is calling for for me. Saul finds himself in this uh, situation and he finds himself now chasing something meaningless with respect to the power and the purpose that is in his life. And I think it's very easy for us in our lives to be chasing things that don't really land us to the place of the kingdom of God and the role that God has called us to play in the kingdom of God. I love the way that the writer in Ecclesiastes talks about it. He says that God has set eternity in our heart. Touch yourself and say eternity. The writer says God has set eternity in our heart, but nobody knows from beginning to end what God will do, but God will make it beautiful in its time. It's this idea that we are walking around with the eternal purpose and design of God in our lives, but we don't know it. Clearly what it looks like, but you feel it. And I ever had that, 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 that feeling? Like, I know God has called me to do something great and important. I know God has called me to do something uh, impactful. I know that God wants me to raise my children in ways that will cause great benefit. I know that God has called me to pursue education in ways that will be able to turn into results. I know God has called me to actually have some money because I've heard the things that I want to do, I'm going to have to have some money for. Somebody can say that. Yeah. I don't preach about money, but money's not the evil. It's the love of money. Yeah. Hey, man, I, you know, I love sometimes, you know, we, you know, because I'm, I'm a, sometimes an anti-money preaching type dude. I'm like, get all out of that. But, you know, everybody like to make a little change on the side. Somebody say that. Yeah. Right? So money's not the problem. It's the love of money. We've got all these different things going on, but at the same time, you recognize God wants to do something through my life. So the question, I think, for us as we start off this uh, conversation or this thinking together is, what, are, what asses are you chasing that are keeping you from chasing God? Um. Some of y'all went into a... <laughs> <laughs> what? But what asses are we chasing that either we're pursuing or we may have, because of the story of our life, been art to pursue that actually is less than what God really might want for our life? You see, I believe that God is calling us to rise above the distractions of our world, even though they aren't bad all the time, so that we can live into God's purpose. It's this idea still from Ecclesiastes 3, that if God has actually set eternity in my heart, if on my heart and in my emotions and in my mind is literally the written handwork of God, that there is a story that God wants to do through my life with, the, with respect to what God wants to do in the world, when I am chasing asses, I am actually not living into what God has called me to do. I am living less than my privilege. You see, if we're chasing the houses, the money, the cars, if we're chasing uh, people, we're chasing relationships, you know, we're chasing him, we're chasing her, we might be missing what God might be calling us to do in our lives. Now, there's nothing wrong with him or her. I just wanted to put that phantom up there because that's my dream car. I'm talking about that. <laughs> Woo! Praise God. Amen. I was going to say one day, but probably not one. No, I'm not, I refuse to drive around in a house. Amen. But I'll just look at it on, online and dream. Praise God. But when we find ourselves living life aimed at trying to pursue what I would argue are these asses, 
we might not be living into the life that God is calling us to live into. That if money and resources and the love of things and the presence of people are what are driving what I get up to do every day and how I make my decisions and what I'm willing to sacrifice about and what I'm willing to invest into, I might actually live into less than what God has called me to be. Touch a person next to you and say, you've got eternity in your heart. So Saul finds himself chasing these asses, chasing other things, but we aren't called to waste our time for things that don't matter, but we are called to lean forward, reaching for the things that have eternal value. I love the way Paul says it in Philippians chapter 3. Paul says, not that I have already obtained all of this. Paul says, I haven't already reached uh, what it is that I want to obtain. I haven't been able to grab what it is that I want. But Paul says, uh, but I want to... Uh, Press forward. I, I haven't arrived at my goal, but I want to press on and take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, Paul says, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do. Somebody say one thing. One thing. Paul says one thing I do, forgetting what is behind me and straining forward toward what is ahead I press on toward the goal, and the King James says, the mark to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Amen. Paul says, I don't want to spend my life chasing asses, but I want to lean forward for that which God has actually called me into righteousness, into healing, and into my purpose. There's a scripture in Philippians 3 where Paul, before this, says, I want to grab a hold to God for that reason that God grabbed a hold to me. Amen. What would it look like? Are y'all feeling this? What would it look like if you actually got synced up with the reason God called you? What would it look like if you actually could get your character aligned with your calling? What would it look like if you could actually get your passion aligned with your purpose? What would your life look like? What would it look like if you could actually get yourself disconnected from the Matrix? Any of y'all seen that movie, The Matrix? Do you remember in the Matrix movie when Neo decided to wake up? He had to go through some process in order to wake up. Neo had to go through a hole and get a little bit dirty and be a little bit tired and be a little bit fatigued and deal with a little resistance in order to wake up and live into God's call. I'm putting that in the matrix. For his life. Amen. That we are called to stop chasing the asses so that we can live into the life that God has called for us. Getting back to Saul. Saul had been running around chasing the asses. You see, it's very easy for us to get distracted by things that are not bad, but things that actually aren't calling us to live into the fullness of our purpose. Now, I want to tell you that you're not just called to work the job that you have. You're not just called to live in the neighborhood that you have. You're not just called to try to have 2.5 kids, a dog named Spike and a white picket fence, and try to live life for 50 years and then get your social security and retire off into the night without anybody bothering you. <laughs> Look at the person next to you and say, you've got eternity in your heart. That God wants to do something in your life because God has you a part of a larger world that God is making. And so when we find ourselves chasing the asses, we keep ourselves from being able to lean into what God has called us to be. Saul finds himself chasing these asses, and he finds that it is an empty venture, and he decides that we need to go ahead and return back to where we came from. And that's oftentimes what happens in chasing the asses. It never really satisfies you to what you know you're called to do, and, and all you find yourself doing is going through the cycles of asses. Anybody ever been trapped in a cycle of asses? Like you, you, you do one thing and you're like, okay, this is me. This is going to be me. This is what I'm going to do. This is going to be my whole life. And then you're like, oh, no, nah, man, forget that. Then you go over to another situation. Okay, this is what it's going to be about. I'm going to build my whole little structure on this. I got my new friends. I got my new situation. I got my funding streams. Oh, no, that's not it either. And all you keep doing is cycling and cycling and cycling through. And how many know that is fatiguing? Yes. Anybody ever chased some asses so long ago that you just fell out in the ground? You just... <laughs> I just can't do it no more. I give up. I surrender. Saul gets to this point where he says, listen, man, we're spending so much time doing this. You know, at a certain point, our father's going to be worried about us. Let's go ahead and go back. But Saul had a servant with him. And this servant told Saul, he said, well, there is a man of God that's in this area. Why don't we go get a word from the Lord around what direction we should take? 
It's the second point I want to give us that we need to stop chasing the asses, but the second thing that we need to do is get a word from the Lord. Yeah. Touch the person next to you and say, you need a word. Yeah. Oh, you didn't tell them real good. Touch them again and say, you need a word. Yeah. You don't just need a paycheck. You need a word. You don't just need more friends. You need a word. You don't just need more opportunities to open up. You need a word. You don't just need God to rain down mercy on your life. You need a word. You don't just need your business plan to work. You need a word. Because when we get a word from God, then it helps give us the word that we need to have in our mouth. And we can keep saying whatever it is that we want to say, but it only is when we begin to say what God is already saying. See, I like to pump it up like this, that God's word is like the internet. You can log on from wherever you are, and the page says the same thing. Uh, did did y'all catch that? That, that God, that, that what God is saying and what God is doing is consistent. Yes. That God has a word that's in season for our life, a word that's in season for our neighborhoods, a word that's in season for our community, that God wants justice, that God wants peace, that God wants the establishment of the kingdom. And if you tap in and get that word, that word would build itself into your life. They go and get a word. And the thing I love about this is the servant gave Saul a push. Saul just wanted to go back and go through the cycles of chasing the asses. But the friend that he had, the servant that he had, gave him a push. As you sojourn towards God's kingdom, we must be asking ourselves the question, who is it that God has put in my life to push me yes. towards the kingdom of God? I think this might also be a way that we need to start evaluating who it is we going to hang around. I'm not trying to rock with you if you're not trying to push me towards the word of God. I'm not trying to rock with you if you're trying to push me into more cycles of chasing the asses. I'm already tired of chasing the asses. I don't got more time to lose. I don't got more life to waste. I don't want to be walking around with you like two kind of silly people walking around. Neither one of us can see. Neither one of us can help one another. And all I'm doing is getting more tired and more busted and more frustrated trying to keep up with you. I need somebody that is pushing me into who God is calling me to be. I need some folks that are pushing me into the way and the will of God. I need somebody that's pushing me to be more faithful. I need someone that's pushing me to be more into justice. I need somebody that's pushing me to be able to serve those that are less fortunate. I need you to push me to be holy. Push me to be righteous. Push me to be like God. Push me to be what God wants me to be. Somebody say, push me. Who in your life do you have that's pushing you towards God? I don't have this question up here, but I think the, the, the reverse question is who is it in your life that's pushing you away? Ooh, some of y'all had to look at the wall. It's funny when you had this vantage point because you get how people react, you know? Say something, somebody said, ooh, I gotta look over there real quick, just like that. <laughs> who is it in your life that is pushing, or what is it in your life that is pushing you away from the purpose and the will of God? We need to get a word. You see, in this passage, the way I love the, the writer describes it, God had a word and a response for the people of Israel. Uh, the Samuel, the prophet, had been sitting in his place, and God had came to the prophet and said, I have heard the cries of my people. And I am sending someone to you who I am going to use to lead my people. And so that word that came from Samuel that subsequently prepared that was all about what God wanted to do in the lives of a people that were dealing with great stress and great pain from the Philistines. Do you realize that God wants to give you a word that gets you from chasing the asses, that gets you closer to living in the life that he's called you to live? Because there are people who only will live into God's destiny for their lives when you start living into God's destiny for yours. Yeah. Do you realize that whether you're a business person or whether uh, you're a lawyer or whether you're washing cars every day or whether you're cooking food at the school or whether you're fixing engines or whether you're studying and doing your dissertation, that everything God wants to do in your life is all about the subsequent advancement of the kingdom of God in the world. 
I want everybody to look down at your hands and realize that these hands God gave me to do the will of God. This mind God gave me was to do the will of God. This heart God gave me was to do the will of God. And I can't spend time chasing the asses. I need to get a word from the Lord. If I get a word, I'll know what I need to do. If I get a word, I'll know where I need to go. If I get a word, I'll know who needs to be with me. If I get a word, I'll be making the right decision. If I get a word, I'll finally begin to understand what is that thing that God is bouncing around in my heart. I'm having dreams at night, and I'm, I'm having ideas and brainstorms, and I know that God has called me to do more than what I'm doing. I know I've been called with purpose. I know God has given me this imagination. I know God has given me this skill set, and I'm tired of being frustrated trying to live below my privilege when I know God has called me to live above this privilege, but I need a word from God, so I don't want to waste time just being mad at people. I don't want to waste time being in a whole lot of drama, but I need to be in the presence of God, where the word of God is, where God can speak to me and revive my heart and revive my spirit and lift me to the places I need to go. Somebody shout a word. What would it look like if you got a word in season in your life? I'm not just talking about a word from the book where you just open it up and say, oh, 1 Chronicles 7, verse 5. And it might be a good scripture, but this will be my word from the day. But I'm talking about get in the presence of God where you get a word from God for this season. That, God, I'm not going to stop chasing you. I'm not going to stop pursuing you until I get a word. I know you've called me. I know you've positioned me. I know you are working in me. And I'm not going nowhere until you bless me. Somebody shout, Lord, bless me. There is a story that I love in the Old Testament about Jacob who wrestled with God all night long. And the angel told him, he said, let me go. He said, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Jacob said, I'm not letting you go until I get a word. I'm not letting you go until I get what I need in order to become who I know I've been called to become. And I'm telling you, it's time for us to stop chasing asses, to stop chasing dumb stuff, and start living into the calling that God has upon us our life. Somebody shout, Lord, give me a word. Oh, come on. You don't say it like you mean it. Somebody say, Lord, give me a word. I'm telling you, when you get a word, it'll supersede anything else that you do. You're looking at somebody. I have not finished college. I got married young. Started having a lot of kids. Y'all see them running around everywhere. And I remember being in a place where I used to think that I was limited from the open doors that God might want me to walk into. And I used to carry around this level of, uh, of insecurity, this level of, of uh, 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 low self-esteem, this sense that, man, I, you know, until I can actually get you know, the march and be able to do some of my education the way that I want it to be, I'm just going to have to live inside this little box. That this is about as far as I can go. But about eight, well, close to ten years ago, I got to this point where God gave me a word. And the word that God gave me was that I can do more than you can ever imagine. That I can open up doors. And all God told me to do was say yes to everything I call you into. You might not think you qualify. You might think, might not think you can perform. You might not think that you can do it, but say yes. If I say step into danger, say yes. If I say step into trouble, say yes. And if you say yes, I will open up doors for you. I'm here to tell somebody and give somebody some hope today that you've been trying to do stuff in your own strength. You've been trying to will it in your own mind. You've been trying to stack the deck and organize the chips. But what you need to get from God is a word. That, Lord, I'm not going to settle for asses. I'm going to pursue the word of God that comes to change me and comes to invite me into my prophetic future. This word of God is very important for us to get. You need to recognize that when Jesus shows up on the scene, John chapter 1, the Bible describes him, the writer describes Jesus saying, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. And the word came and dwelt among us. It became flesh. 
that Jesus is this word. That when you go to get the word, you really get Jesus. You want to get Jesus? It's not about saying a prayer. It's about getting in the presence of God and saying, fill me with everything that you are. Direct my life. Direct my trajectory. And I'm willing to follow and be who you're calling me to be. Do you recognize that God wants to set some of y'all up to influence great things in the community? Do you know that God wants to sit you before kings and princes? That God wants to sit you before people of great influence? But we can't do that without the word. Yeah. Oh, you can, you, can, you can be smart. You can be qualified. We need to be skilled. We need to be prepared. But you need to have the word. Yeah. Ooh, the word, the word. Somebody say the word. Matthew chapter 8, verses 5, you have an occupier, the Roman centurion, living in oppressed territory of the Jews. And even he understood about the power of the word. He tells them, my servant is sick. Jesus, will you come? And he says, Jesus, you don't even have to come. Just say the word. Just say the word. Jesus, if you say the word, I know some stuff will happen. Jesus, if you say the word, I know my servant will be healed. Jesus, if you say the word, I know things will change. What would it look like if our prayer became, Lord, I don't need you to give me money. I don't need you to open doors. Lord, speak a word over my life. Let that word get inside me. Let that word begin to change me. Let that word begin to possess me. Let me become the manifestation of your word. Ooh. I feel that. I don't know if y'all feel that. Yes. That we need a word from the Lord. Instead of being disrupted, we must get a word. Isaiah 55, God says, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word goes out from my mouth, it will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish. Somebody say accomplish. It will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Brothers and sisters, when you get a word from God, you can take it to the bank. Now listen, when I say a word from God, I'm not talking about buying spring water on TBN for $13.99 from the little preacher that's brought you some spring water from Israel, and he's going to mail you a piece of a handkerchief and, and, and then tell you that, you know, um, you got eight prayer requests, so you need to sow $80 for them eight prayer requests, which means $700 for him, and God going to bless you. Look at the person next to you said, you don't need that word. <laughs> Look at him again and said, that ain't no word. I said ain't for all the English majors, praise God. Ain't. That is not a word, but you need to get a word from the Lord, which means you must go position yourself in the presence of God. I know we go to church and church can get old and you're just like, okay, what's the message going to be? What's the space going to be? I got more things to do in my life besides sit around church, but don't you don't need to trip around this church. Anybody who has experienced great deliverance and great power of God in their life will tell you that it's all about being in the presence of God. Sometimes you're going to feel it. Sometimes you're not going to feel it. Sometimes you're going to understand it. Sometimes you're not but if you sit there before God and say, until you give me a word, I'm hanging out here. I'm back here in a hammock. Until you give me a word, I'm not going nowhere. Somebody shout a word. God wants to give us a word. And after you get that word, then you need to move on with your life. That's the third point, is that we need to move on with our life. When God spoke to Samuel, and said, I'm going to give you a word to bring to Saul. Saul arrives at his place, and he wants to talk to Samuel about the asses and all the rest of the stuff that, that, that Samuel's into. And, and, and Samuel tells him, you didn't come here for us to have a conversation about the asses. What you need to recognize is that the favor of God is upon your life. That the grace of God has come to your house. That God is actually trying to birth out of you more than what you realize is inside of you. And he tells Saul, stop worrying about the asses. And it's time for you to get focused on what God has really called for your life. Uh, uh, Samuel tells him, I'm going to ask you to leave the asses alone. They've already been found. They've taken care of themselves. But in the next chapter, if you have a chance to read, he sends him forward and he tells him, go 
unto this hill. You're going to run into a group of prophets, and they're going to be prophesying. And he says, you go that way, and God's going to do something different. Moving on with our life means when we get the word from God, we live into the word from God. Yes. So you can get a word from God, but if you don't do nothing, then that word has no power. We must live into the word of God. Everybody say repentance. Yes. Say it again, repentance. Yes. So repentance, the difference, I want to give us this, the difference from confession and repentance is confession, in the way that I like to describe it, is the articulation, the, the, the demonstration, the understanding that, that I need to get something out, that I've done something wrong, that I've missed the mark. But repentance is about turning away from that thing. Turning away from chasing the asses. Turning away from the folks that are pushing you away from God's call. Turning away and taking that word and allowing it to direct your life. Saul goes on the other side of the mountain and he runs into a company of prophets, of people who are out there prophesying the word of the Lord. And the Bible says that Saul was turned into another man. Do you realize that God wants to turn you into who you really are? You actually think you know who you are. You're sitting up there like, I know who I am. I don't know what he's talking about. I know who I am. I am, you know, uh, I don't even know why I'm doing this whole persona. But in any case, whoever that is, right, I know who I am. Ain't nobody going to tell me who I am. I'm this person, and this is my family, and this is where we come from, and this is who I am. You don't even know who you are. And God is actually trying to turn you inside out to show you who you are. Peter thought he was a fisherman. He didn't know that God had made him an apostle. Paul thought he was a furniture maker. He didn't know that God had made him apostle. Matthew was a hustler. <laughs> a government hustler. Working for the IRS, still the folk money, praise God. But he didn't know who he was. Simon, one of Jesus' followers, was Depending on perspective, a terrorist. But he didn't know who he was. Could it be that you are somebody more than who you think you are and that God is actually trying to move you through a process to try to get you to realize who you really are? This is why you need a word. Oh, you don't just need a blessing from God to come anoint what you already have. That's called an idol. Somebody say an idol. Amen. An idol is when we create something and then try to ask God to bless it. Amen. You can read it in the book with Cain and Abel. God asked for a sacrifice. He told them how to bring the sacrifice. And Cain, and he told them the sacrifice was kill an animal. You gutted it, you drained all the blood out, and you came and you burned that as a sacrifice to God. Cain said, I'm not a shepherd. I'm not into animals. I actually went to the Agricultural School of Eden. I've got my degree in fruits and vegetables and other wonderful grains. And, and I actually don't see the necessity of bringing God a dead animal. I mean, it just actually doesn't agree with my sensibilities about what it is that we're trying to do in this kind of, you know, emerging sense of civilization on this calendar of great time in our Hebrew walk. And so I, I'm actually going to make an agricultural um, presentation for God because this will help God. God actually is not understanding the power of agriculture and I think my presentation will help God move a little bit further into Godness and understand kind of what his expression needs to be. He doesn't understand the intersectionality of both agriculture and meat. And so I'm going to begin to uh, help God understand because Tens of thousands of years later, people will need to really have a deep analysis around both agriculture. I'm going to help God. So he comes and he brings God his sacrifice. <laughs> and God doesn't receive it. But Abel brings God out of the simplicity of what God said, what God wants. And God receives his sacrifice. And you know what was Cain's response? He killed his brother. You see, when we don't move on with our lives, we actually become people who are dangerous to the unfolding story of what God is trying to do in the world. Because we then begin to live out what I like to call the spirit of the Antichrist. 
The spirit of the Antichrist ain't, you know, it's not like those, some of those old, you know, uh, you know, eschatology movies or end of the world movies where, you, you know, it's always usually a really, you know, thin, blonde hair, white guy in a nice suit that's going to be the commander of the world and destroy everything, right? But in America, you know, everybody is the Antichrist depending on if you don't like the president, right? So I remember when, when I was a kid, Reagan was Antichrist, and then Clinton was Antichrist, and then Obama was Antichrist. Everybody's Antichrist. The spirit of the Antichrist is that spirit that is Antichrist. Am I living a walk that is pro-Christ or anti-Christ? And what is the confession that I must have? What is God calling me to renounce that I might be pro-Christ? Somebody say, be pro-Christ. Pro say it again, be pro-Christ. Pro God spoke to Samuel that invited Saul moving forward. We must ask ourselves this question, what are we moving on from? to live into this idea of no more asses. What's God calling you to move on from? Who is God calling you to move on from? Are your feet dug in so deep that you like, I'm not moving, this is me, this is who I am, and that's just it. Or do you want to hear a word from the Lord? Do you want to live out the fullness of who God has called you to be? Psalm 37 and 4 says, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. I want to switch the scripture a little bit in ways that we've thought about this. That when you delight yourself in the Lord, God will give your heart the right kind of desires. I don't preach the Santa, the Santa Claus, Jesus. Right? I do what God wants me to do, and then, you know, rain down blessings on me. Right? No, when you delight yourself in the Lord, when you commit yourself to hang out in the presence of God, God will give your heart the right kinds of desires it needs to have. So I'll begin to desire what is holy. I'll desire what is righteous. I'll desire a way that's committed to bring justice in the world. I'll desire a way that's committed to bring righteousness. I'll desire to actually accumulate money and resources so that I can fund the kind of work that needs to happen in our community that nobody else will do. I'll desire the right thing. But it happens when you commit your way to the Lord. That God is not looking for more chiefs, more bosses. God is looking for more followers. This happens, friends, when we get into the presence of God. This happens when we stop chasing the asses and we start chasing God. Somebody say, chase God. chase God. You need to start getting this in your mouth when you wake up in the morning that my positive confession is I'm going to chase God today. I'm not going to chase my boss's affirmation. I'm not going to chase, you know, the person who's laying next to me who's driving me crazy, but I keep making excuses why I love them. <laughs> and I got to pray at night so I'll wake up and choke them out in the middle of the night. <laughs> Then I'm not going to chase those realities. I'm not going to chase the dream that sometimes is nothing but a nightmare. And I'm not going to chase falsehood. I'm not going to chase this American idea of individual exceptionism. I'm not going to chase the things I've dug my feet into, but I'm going to chase after God. I know for some of us that might feel real kind of, that just feels real kind of ethereal right? and esoteric. I can't wrap my mind around what that means. Well, wrap your mind around what it means. Start pursuing God. Pursue God through prayer. Pursue God through reading the scriptures. Pursue God with being around people that are trying to follow God. Pursue God by doing the work of God in the world. But chase God every day you wake up. I got to go to work, but I'm going to chase God. If you're a lawyer, do law while chasing God. If you're in business, do business while chasing God. But whatever you do, say, my life is given to the pursuit of of God. This is my positive confession. No more asses. I'm not following anything stupid anymore. I refuse to be a slave 
to things that are less than my privilege. I refuse to be a slave to things that destroy and dehumanize other people. I refuse to be a slave to a system of falsehood, but I am God's daughter, I am God's son, and I'm going to step forward and say, God, give me a word in season. I'm coming to chase your plan. I'm coming to chase your world, and I'm riding with God until the wheels fall off. And could it be that out of that bold kind of faith, that risky kind of faith, that you might find out who you really are? That God has put anointing in your hands. That God wants to bring you out. I know a lot of us came out of some tough situations. Abuse. Family members who told us we were nothing. A lot of us first generation of people to go to college and actually live somewhere that ain't falling in on itself. And we hear sometimes it's easy to hear these words and say, good for you, Ben McBride. I, I hope you do well with that. But I'm trying to make sure I get my stuff. But what I'm lifting up for you all, brothers and sisters, there is a world God told Samuel, I've heard the cries of my people with respect to their enemies, the Philistines. So I'm sending Saul to you. Saul thinks he's chasing the asses. But I'm actually about to do something in Saul's life to free my people from a bondage, oppression, and the attack. Somebody is praying that God would come meet them. And you may be the answer to that prayer. Are we really committed to our asses so much that we'll deny the potential of God showing up in the lives of our community? Are we committed to the asses so much that, that we will actually allow others to continue to drown in pain? And I recognize, I love one of these scriptures with Jesus, where this man had a sick son, and he asked Jesus to heal his son. Jesus said, do you believe and I can. And the man said, Lord, I believe, but help me where I still doubt. Amen. Is there anybody here that says, you know what, Ben, I believe, but I also got doubt. All right, not y'all, y'all very spiritual, but I know my hand is up. It's like, Lord, I know you're calling me to do something. I know it. I know it more than I know anything else. But I'm scared of the cost. I'm scared of being abandoned. I'm scared of not having enough to finish the job. I'm scared to be poor. I'm scared, but Lord, I believe. And I'm willing to say, Lord, would you call me from chasing those asses? Lord, if you've got a word for me, I want to posture myself to hear your word. May I we enter a season of hearing God's voice that we can move on with the life that God has called us to have. Stand on your feet.